this, let's have a presentation. As introduced, my name is Madenge Ndohio. I practice a branch of medicine uh, known as general surgery. Basically, we are surgeons of the digestive system. That's most of what we do. And so a bit of what we'll be talking about has to do with uh, my interest or our interest as general surgeons in the digestive system. And I really would like to thank uh, 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 PCA, uh, Kahas Kukari, uh, CAC session, and particularly um, uh, uh, Reverend JC for inviting me and for trusting me with his pulpit. I have many friends in this uh, church. I think it's, it's, it's correct to say I'm a friend of this church and have many friends in this church. I and my family, I, we are married with, uh, uh, to Wangeshi, who is sitting upstairs there. Uh, she's a blessing in my life. I thank the Lord for her every day. Because in some of these professions that uh, are held in high esteem in society, sometimes they can go to your head. And it's good to have someone who can easily, with a look or one word, set you back to default settings. <laughs> so I thank the Lord for her. Um, we are blessed with four children, um, two adults and two teens. Uh, some of them may be here with us today. So that's me. And uh, I, serve, I practice at Nyeri County Hospital. I know many of you are from Nyeri. And uh, I, I'm delighted and to serve because people call me sometimes and say this and this is happening. So that's why I said I have many friends here, and yeah, it's glad, it's glad to be back. All right, so today we have a, 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 a quick message, or a simple message to pass, that uh, God will ask ourselves, does God have a purpose for, our, for us as physical beings? We know that God is a spirit being whom we commune with through the Holy Spirit, communes with our spirits through the Holy Spirit, and a lot of the time when we come to church, that's what we are addressing. We are addressing our relationship to God as spirit beings. But does God have value and purpose for us as, uh, as, as, as physical beings? So I had included their self-introductions because sometimes I forget. And I just talk and talk and talk. And then in the end, people, and we don't know who you are. So at least I've said who I am. So what's God's purpose for physical man? And we've had... Uh, we, we look at the words of, uh, we've heard the words of Genesis uh, 1, 26 to 27. Uh, then we will consider some words in Exodus 31. We'll look at uh, what First Corinthians 6 says and other verses. And then we will see that yes, God has a purpose for us as physical beings. And therefore we need to be healthy in order to serve or in order to achieve God's purposes. And then, so we will ask ourselves, how do we maintain good health in line with the theme of understanding our health? So, um, next. So, in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, it's been read to us um, clearly that God created man for a purpose. And that purpose is stated that we were to be fruitful in, in verse 28. Fill the earth, rule the earth, and subdue it, and everything that is in it. And shortly thereafter, we see that God needed physical man to do that. Because um, when we move on to chapter 6 of Genesis, God now needs Noah to do physical things. So many physical things. Build an ark, and, 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 and then... Uh, put in all the animals that needed to be put in, which he had to know, and Noah would have known, because as you well know, in uh, Genesis 2, verse 19, God tasks man to name animals. God did not name the animals. He created them, but he tasked us to name them. So it starts to be clear that God had a purpose and has a purpose uh, for physical man. And then... Uh, I want to emphasize something here before we move away from it. That God actually, uh, when, after creating everything else, in Genesis 1, 24, uh, 25, he 
it ends that and God saw and it was good. But after creating man, in verse 31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. So after creating everything else, God says it was good. After creating man, he said it was very good. So it means we have a special place in creation. Even God, the God who created us, so that we were very good once we were added to creation. And in Exodus 31, uh, uh, 1 to 6, it becomes very, very clear that God has great value for physical man. And that God actually creates each one of us with a purpose. And this is the story that begins from Exodus 25. And in the next six chapters, follows a very elaborate discussion, very elaborate instructions and detailed instructions to Moses on how to build the sanctuary so that God would come and live among his people. On how to build the sanctuary that was called the tabernacle. And if we pause there for a moment, let it strike you how detailed God is. That God makes everything to precise detail. And then you get to realize that even as a scientist, and there are many seated here, sometimes we think we know a lot. But it humbles you to realize that actually science has probably not even just scratched the surface of the knowledge the surface of what God has done. That what God has done is deliberate and it is purpose built and is completely fit for purpose. And sometimes we try and change things and manipulate things using science and think we are also clever and we end up causing problems and we will see a bit of that as we go on. So that's the story of uh, the building of the ark where the Lord instructed Moses and said to Moses, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. So as we are following the theme of Proverbs 1, can you see the source? That the source is the, the Lord, the God who created us, has, is actually the source of all that which we are looking for. And he continues to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and engage in all kinds of craft. Moreover, I have appointed Oholiab, son of Ahisamak of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. In other words, Wherever it, whatever profession you are in, whatever gifts God has given you, he has given you for a purpose. And he has given you for his purposes to achieve his ends. And therefore, it's quite clear, even if we do not continue from there, it should be absolutely clear that God has a purpose for physical man. And then the, the, in the word that was read to us in the second reading, Paul now is emphasizing why we should not defile our bodies because they are the temple. They are the temple in which the spirit lives, the spirit that communes with God. Second, uh, give us the, uh, the next slide. And he also does go to say that we are not necessarily just glorifying our bodies because in 2 Corinthians 8, he, he says, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, he says, he calls it the tent. Paul calls it the tent. So we are also to realize that it's not that we are glorifying our bodies. This is temporary. But yes, we do need to take care of it. Now, we need healthy bodies to serve God. Timothy, uh, uh, Paul said to Timothy, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Now, some people just stop at the wine eh? and say, no, nah, eh, eh, eh. It is written. Yeah, it was written. But maybe we shall see uh, uh, shortly. At that time, when I looked at the uh, cultural background study Bible, 
it explains that culturally at that time, they considered a little wine as medicinal. It was also very dilute wine. It was one part wine, four parts water. They considered it as medicinal. While there was elaborate water systems in, 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 in uh, Roman cities, as was in Corinth at the time, uh, uh, their knowledge of hygiene was probably not very good. And therefore, waterborne diseases were common. So that's why Timothy appeared to have been susceptible to this. And Paul realizes that for this gentleman to be effective in service, he has to be healthy. And therefore makes a suggestion as an older, as a mentor to him, makes a suggestion to him, do this so that you may be healthy. And in Third John, the leading word, uh, 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 this was Apostle John speaking to Gaius, whom he was discipling, and saying to him, you know, wishing him good health, not just, uh, even as he was, you know, he, he noted that he was, uh, or he prayed for him, that he would be uh, 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 developing in his knowledge of God, he wishes him good health. Because again, to be effective, he had to be in good health. So let's ask ourselves, how can we be healthy? What are the determinants of physical health? After close to 30 years of medical practice now, you, you get to realize, you know, in the early years as a doctor, you are so keen on learning diseases and learning all the ways to treat them. Then after practice, then you realize, uh, you know, people still keep falling sick. And you ask ourselves, is there something that we could do? So that preventive medicine starts to make more sense, a lot more sense. And you even start to wish you were taught more of it. And you even start to wish we would teach more of it. So that we know the things to do so that we don't fall ill at all. We may still fall ill, but at least we can either prevent ourselves from falling ill at all or reduce the effects of whatever illnesses. And when you are in a community like this, eh, when you stop, when typhoid is no longer a danger or malaria or any other infectious disease, then I would guarantee you that in a community like this, the largest cause of sickness and death will be what are called non-communicable diseases. These are the things that cannot be communicated or cannot be passed on to somebody else. These are the high blood pressure, diabetes, overweight, heart disease, strokes. And so we are going to briefly look at how to prevent those because those are our major dangers. Those are the dangers we face. So there are factors we can modify and there are those we can't modify. Know your genes. Yeah? They say, Ugali na fanana na unga eh, ambayili ilitoka kwa, how do you, hey, it's hard to translate. Gima yuma ga mutuine. Ay, that's hard. Okay, so that's what it means. You can explain to your neighbor just in case that didn't make sense to them. So you are made of the same stuff your people are made of. So if there is diabetes in the family, in the people that, uh, you know, brought you into this earth, then know that you are at risk of that. If there's high blood pressure, then you are at risk of that. And you need to do stuff to uh, make sure that you, are, uh, 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 you take care of yourself. Then there are things we can modify, thankfully. One of the biggest is lifestyle. Then another very big one is nutrition. And we'll spend a little more time looking at that. So that we are not helpless, even if in our genes, like in my family, my late father was diabetic and hypertensive, and my mother, who is 80, is diabetic and hypertensive. And therefore, I have more than a, a chance of more than many of you who don't have that kind of history. And therefore, I must know what I should do. Next. So we must know what we, we, we would do to prevent ourselves from falling sick. And move to the next again. So let's start with the first one which is nutrition, food. Move next. And in Genesis 1.29, the God who created us, we have just seen and agreed and seen in the word, he is a God of detail, fine, minute detail. And he prescribed a diet for man in verse 29. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And so, the next statement I'm going to make after this is that God prescribed a plant-based diet. But I didn't come here to preach to you to be vegetarians. 
watu wa kanyama hamkusahaulika in chapter na, in, in verse uh, in, in chapter 9 of genesis verse 3 after the flood nyama ilifunguliwa pia all right so it says in genesis uh, 9 verse 3 everything that lives and moves about will be food for you just as i gave you the green plants i now give you everything the king james verse on it puts it even better everything that liveth and moveth will be meat for you and it, i keep thinking this is the bit that the chinese read well and and i and sijui mbona tunawashanga hapa walisoma vizuri but notice that as soon as meat is introduced rules start to follow all right because in in genesis 9:4 already there are some rules starting to come but you must not eat meat that has life blood in it i only use that as an example to suggest that rules followed and when you go now to leviticus to leviticus 11 you find there are even more rules now theologians tell us there are a lot of reasons that that was done that that, that they got those rules in order to be ritually clean but the fact is we don't see that or those kind of rules with the plant based foods the plant based foods was carte blanche everything you can eat everything and therefore and science has also now agreed it didn't always agree but it has agreed now that the food you want to eat most of your diet needs to be plant based and as close to the original that's what we mean by unprocessed or minimally processed as close to the original as possible that's what we mean and we'll see why shortly so then when it comes to meat fish poultry in terms of how often how much everything of course in moderation even in plant food based food in excess or uh, would of course be unhealthy for you but Uh, the sweet spot seems to lie somewhere between 2 to 4 times a week that's what you know and those are observational studies looking at places where people live healthy and live long scientists have gone out and looked at places like that and there's about five places in the world which are identified where you can find a 100 year old man who jumps on his horse and goes to herd his animals so uh, uh, looking at that this again holds that kind of evidence also holds that people who eat mainly plant based foods and a wide variety you see they were a wide variety why because what one food lacks the other one has what one grain lacks the other one has so a wide variety and by the way i also looked a little back at the history those of you who are from the agekoyo community the history written again about if you read the history books written say like in the 1930s the 1940s uh, like one written by Louis Leakey and one written by a catholic father father Cagnolo who had settled at uh, uh, Madari the one of the pioneer missionaries at Madari they are very clear also that those people ate a very wide variety they had many types of foods meat was not consumed often but they consumed milk liberally all right so let's move on So what is processed food what are we saying it's any food that is altered from its original or natural state that should be fairly straightforward move on and i looked in our own home where to nawangeshi and that's what i found just in our home and uh, the none of those things is has any resemblance to the food that it is claimed to have come from All right and that's what we mean that is processed food and i have pointed to something there with a, a, a red arrow just move to the next slide and i wanted to single out that one component now the only person who understands what that is i can see him and he has already smiled he is called dr motweri <laughs> that's probably the only person who understands even probably understands it better than i do something called trans fatty acid that's a type of fat in a margarine move to the next slide now see that article in august this year i'll read it for you it may not be very clear there that 
Kenya not following doctor's orders on cutting killer fats. No country in East Africa has eliminated the fats known as trans fats or trans fatty acids despite a 2023 deadline recommended by the United Nations. That one they got a little wrong. It's by the World Health Organization. Now, what do they do? What's the problem? They clog arteries, your blood vessels, increasing the risk of heart attack and death. Non-communicable diseases. They are present in most of the solid cooking fats sold in Kenya, margarines, and in some liquid oils. The chemicals are then transferred to many fried and baked foods, such as cakes, cookies, bread, mandazi, and chapati. So then you might wonder, how come then it's on sale on our markets? This move started in the US. They realized that these uh, toxic components in food, and they come from the processing of cooking oils, right? Cooking oil is one of the hidden, move on to the next slide, is one of the hidden uh, 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 foods, uh, 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 hidden processed foods in our diets, all right? And we shall see then as we move why we need to move away from them. Because they were causing these uh, diseases, the, 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 the US government banned them effectively. And they have actually now switched in their markets. But why we have small quantities is because they said that if the food contains less than 0 0.5 grams per 100 grams of those trans fatty acids, then it, there is no evidence of harm. That's a play with words. There is no evidence of harm. We have lawyers in the house. If we have no evidence of harm, is it equal to proof of no harm? It is not equal to proof of no harm. It may be we don't have evidence of harm now. Because it takes a long time. For the proof of harm to come. Now, are we going to go to supermarkets and keep reading all those small labels? We will never finish shopping. So what do we do? The only thing you need to remember, it needs to be as close to the original. Yeah, that's the only message you need to carry home. We, I looked at also maize flour as a good example. Again, this one is in our home. And I know some of you work in the food industry or have food industries. I have not been sent to finish anybody in the food industry. And, uh, but I want to highlight something. If you look at that, at that middle column, that is the nutritional analysis of what is contained in what is called grade one sifted maize flour. But we shall shortly ask ourselves which one is really grade one. The analysis on the right side, the white one, is an analysis of the nutritional value of whole grain maize. And you can see that that list in green, which I took off the label from the packet of unga, in Nikakonde Sana, that list is very small. There is a whole list of nutrients. And let me just compare one or two for you. Protein content is in the grade, what is being called grade one, six percent. In the original, it is 10 to 15 percent. Uh, fiber, dietary fiber, in maize in the original whole grain, 29 percent. In the, what is being called grade one, three percent. No, actually 0 0.7 percent, 0 0.7 percent. In other words, Whatever was removed went away with a lot of the nutrients. It also goes away with a lot of the micronutrients, the proteins, the vitamins, the little elements that you need in small quantities. I have been asked here because I've talked to the men, the ladies who are not there, so let me tell you what they asked me. They asked me about something called Uji Power. Pole wana ume ni mawashitaki. Na, what are men looking for when they are Look, uh, you know, uh, uh, want to consume Uji power. 
One of the vitamins required for the vitality of men is vitamin E. Whole grain maize has vitamin E. Once you process it to what is now being called grade 1, the vitamin E goes away. So again, let us think about going back to consuming it as close to the original because God made it perfectly. God made it and it was perfect as it was made. All right. So let's see what are the effects of consuming processed foods. And we said a lot of this movement across the world has come from America. Where out of a population of about 112 million, 50%, half of the U.S. population, 56 million people have one non-communicable disease or other. 56. And those of you who have been there, and a lot of Kenyans work there in the healthcare industry, they know that and they will tell you that. 70% of the population of the U.S. today are overweight or obese. 70%. So what changed? In the 1940s, they changed their diets. As they got in industrialized, they, 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 and their lifestyles changed, they started eating more and more uh, 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 processed food and also moving less. So shortly after this, we shall see also the effect of switching to processed food and then reducing exercise. And so uh, uh, they have that almost uh, epidemic of uh, an uncommunicable diseases. And from 2022, they actually now have a very heavily funded, government funded initiative to move back towards natural food that they are calling food is medicine. And it's very interesting that now they are talking about ancestral diets. Hey, come on. These are the same chaps who told us what we were eating was not good. You know, came here and yeah, so we started eating everything that, or maybe we were the problem. We didn't know what we had was already good enough and we, were, we allowed ourselves to be swayed towards processed food. Okay, let's move on. I'll give you another short example of a small country called Nauru. Nauru is a small country in the Pacific, like between Australia and the U.S., you know, maybe if you are going there from Kenya, it might be easier to go through the center of the earth and come out on the other side. Then you'd, you'd land there. A very small country, smaller than the size of Deca town, with a population of 11,000. 80% of a wheat. 50% of the adults diabetic. How did they get there? Move on, please. Look at them in 1914. Those are young people. Healthy, strong. Six pack, two pack, some other packs at the back. The, you know, very healthy, strong young people. And then look at them in 2007. What happened? Let's, next slide. Before, just go back one. Before westernization, they used to walk. Remember, it's a very small island. You can walk across two times in one day. And garden, they would eat, their, 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 they would uh, garden their own food, farm their own food and fish in canoes. But they had phosphate. The island had high quality phosphate, which the West was very interested in. And when this island achieved independence from Australia, they were colonized by the Australians who were mining the phosphate. They were the richest country per capita at that time, richer than even the US, because they had so much money that the citizens simply sat and the government paid them. So they moved off their farms for the phosphate to be mined, and they would receive a check at the end of the month. And they simply sat down, bought vehicles, motorcycles. There was two motorized vehicles for each citizen of the country. And that's how they ended up getting their move on. So they were eating fresh fish, fresh meat before that, coconuts, fruits. They moved from all that. And because all their land had been ripped up, it's actually a tragedy that even Kenyans should study. Extractive industries in a country. That's what they would do to you. They were eating white rice, canned meat canned from a supermarket. Everything was being imported from Australia, actually. And that's how they ended up now with that kind of crisis. From no diabetes in 1993, in 1933, to now where they are. So it's clear that as a population, and we are probably there, maybe with a little better leadership, 
we could actually be heading in the direction of uh, proper industrialization. So we must be warned that as you are moving in that direction, maintain your food in as natural a state as possible. Move on. And so what are wholesome foods? Things like that. What is it? That is mbosho and pumpkin and some mango and a beverage of your choice. Move on. And that's a good meal for breakfast. But somebody might say this one is even better. You know food is also cultural. Eh? And some of us believe that uh, because we ate so much pumpkin as children, I don't ever want to see it again. <laughs> Do you know now <laughs> that actually in America, pumpkin is being touted as a wonder food? So we knew that from the beginning. So the problem with this we've seen is process. And I'm not saying don't eat it. But let it not be what you consume most of the days. Thank you. Move on. <clears throat> so another good example, that is ugali with sukuma and some egg again in the morning. And you know, these people from central province have a bad name for ugali from last night. Eh? They call it ugali of Murara. And people are, I don't know why, <laughs> it's like people are not supposed to be eating it. Yeah? What is the problem? Very good food. Whole grain maize, and you'll be okay for the whole day. Why are we talking about breakfast? Because if you don't eat well before you leave your house, once you go out there, you will get hungry. And when you get hungry, what are you going to do? Remember those cakes? The mandazi that were mentioned in the Star newspaper article. And they were right, because those studies have been done. So, and make sure that it is balanced. All the food types in it. And you will be healthy. Thank you. So enough about food. I think the message is clear. So please go home. Have a, a public participation? No. I think that one is family participation. <laughs> Have family participation. Sit together as a family and agree and it, we've said it's simple just go back to the original and you have an expo coming some of you are farmers here why can't we have those foods you supplying to this community in this church in your group i have sukuma organically grown i have this or the other i use only manure if it has it has a few holes from a few weevils it means uh, from a few insects it means it is healthy. It has no chemicals in it. Some of you farm, whatever it is. So you can, uh, you know, collaborate among each other. Very well. So let's talk about exercise. What exercise should you do? Now, these bodies were made to move. So sometimes people ask, how long should I exercise? How often? The whole day. You were made to move. Ukiamuka, you were made to move. All right? And again, you remember those areas I said in the world where people are healthy? It shows that those people move. The interesting thing is, it's actually low intensity or moderate intensity exercise is sufficient. So, you, do, you know, we were told that you have to go to the gym and sweat how many liters of sweat? Just normal movement. And I suspect maybe that's why ladies outlive us men. Because they're always moving. Cleaning the house, doing some house chores, doing, you know, they're always moving. So, whatever, if you are doing zero now, start with something. Start somewhere from where you are. Just start by walking. And consider that every day you must do some exercise. How do you tell you are doing moderate exercise? It's an activity that you can do and still hold a conversation. Sometimes when young people come here to lead praise and worship, some of them can, they tell us to jump, they are jumping, and you can't even hear them uh, panting for breath here on the mic. Hallelujah! And even after three minutes of that, the fellow is still. So for them, that's moderate exercise. If for you, all you can do is hallelujah, start with that. And as you progress, you will increase your tolerance. Enough about exercise. Let's talk about sleep. You ought to sleep seven to eight hours a day for optimal health. Seven to eight hours? I can already hear a wow behind me here. 
How will you achieve that? By practicing sleep hygiene. And I invite you to go and Google this, research it a bit more. Sleep hygiene. Sleep on hygiene. The use of electronic gadgets. God set a clock in our minds, in our brains, called the pineal gland. The pineal gland receives signals from the back of the eye. In the morning, it reads the angle of entry of the sun rays and signals your brain it is time to wake up through the pineal gland. And everything else is set in motion to wake you up. And at sunset, that same uh, angle now signals your brain that it is time to wind down and sleep. But the electronic gadgets, the light they emit, confuses that system. So as much as you can put away the electronic gadgets before it's your bedtime, make sure it's as quiet as possible. We live in urban noisy environments. And also make sure it's as dark as possible. Sometimes, you know, we got the mulikamwizi outside your gate. You are very happy because there is security. But then there is so much light in your house. And light passes through closed eyelids. Eh? You know that. So you are not sleeping well because of that. So sleep hygiene. We don't have enough time to go into all of it, but at least I've signaled you that you can go and look at it more. So in summary, food is medicine. And you know medicine can, a, a, a good food is medicine. And processed food, plant-based with reduction in the amount of uh, meat taken, maybe two to four times in a week, food is medicine. Plant-based and processed, do moderate exercise and sleep seven to eight hours most days of the week. And so, if we do that, we have a promise in Psalm 92 that the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will glow, grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Straight. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. So God did not promise us an old age of sickness. He promises us a fruitful old age. Proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.